on World News Tonight. Bilateral meetings. President Joe Biden welcomes Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the White House, hosting Modi for a private dinner ahead of a much larger state dinner. Terror runs rampant. Israel's military killed three members of a terrorist cell in a rare drone strike in the occupied West Bank, further escalating the deadly violence. Amazon in hot water. Amazon sued by FTC over alleged deceptive user interface designs once again. Land of the Dragons. Dragon boat races and four cultural activities take center stage across China. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News and we are opening today with the latest as US President Joe Biden and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi are expected to deepen defense and technology cooperation between their countries during Modi's official visit to the White House despite lingering concerns about human rights in India. U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the White House on Wednesday, with the pair expected to deepen defense and technology cooperation between their countries during Modi's first official state visit. Washington wants India to be a strategic counterweight to China, while Modi seeks to raise India's influence on the global stage, with his country now the world's most populous at 1.4 billion. Sources told Biden's administration will time the visit with a move to make it easier for skilled Indians to live and work in the United States. According to a person familiar with the matter, the State Department could announce as soon as Thursday that a small number of Indians and other foreign workers on H-1B visas will be able to renew those visas in the U.S. without having to travel abroad. It's part of a pilot program that could be expanded in coming years, helping skilled workers enter or remain in the country. But the trip comes with pressure on Biden from his fellow Democrats to raise human rights with Modi, amid concerns about democratic backsliding in India under Modi's Hindu nationalist Paratiya Janata Party. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters on Tuesday Biden is expected to discuss the issue with the Indian leader. The pair are set to deliver remarks and take questions from journalists on Thursday. It's an event a senior White House official called a big deal. Modi has not addressed a single press conference in India since becoming prime minister about nine years ago. More news in India. Now temperatures in northern and eastern India have been reaching record highs with hospitals overwhelmed with patients. Hospitals in India's northern Uttar Pradesh state have been filling up with patients who have fallen ill due to scorching heat. At a district hospital in Balaya, heat stroke patients lie in front of cooling fans and use oxygen supplies. Temperatures have soared close to 45 degrees Celsius in recent days in Balaya with a severe power crisis compounding the situation. Uttar Pradesh's Balaya district, about 970 kilometers southeast of New Delhi. A Hindu priest in the district said the number of bodies brought to a crematorium near the river Ganges has doubled in the past week as the heat wave continues to ravage parts of the country. The Indian Meteorological Department issued a red alert warning last week for extreme heat in some regions of the country, including Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. The Times of India reported that at least 54 people died in a district in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh over the last few days, and authorities are investigating if the loss of lives was due to the heat wave in the region. The government fired Divarkar Singh, the chief medical officer at the main state hospital in Balaya, for saying that the deaths were due to heat, sparking a political row. India records an average of five to six heat waves annually in its northern regions between March and June, and sometimes until July according to the World Health Organization. Israel's military killed three members of a terrorist cell in a rare drone strike in the occupied West Bank, further escalating the deadly violence that has roiled the territory in recent days. It's believed to be the first drone strike in the area in nearly 20 years. It happened close to the shop in Janine in the occupied West Bank. The Israeli army said it had targeted a car carrying suspected Palestinian gunmen. Palestinian media said three people were killed. Tensions have been running high this week. Earlier on Wednesday, hundreds of mourners attended the funeral of an Israeli teenager. The 17-year-old was killed a day earlier along with three other Israelis in an attack carried out near the Jewish settlement Eli by members of the militant group Hamas. Hamas says that the attack was a response to an Israeli raid on a refugee camp in Jenin, which killed seven Palestinians. 
There is no safe place in the camp. At any minute there could be a raid. We are afraid for our children to go outside. If I want to go to the market, I have to hurry home so I can feel safe with my children. Since then, Israeli settlers have attacked Palestinian towns in the governorate of Nablus, setting cars and homes on fire. Palestinians said one man was killed in the violence. As tensions soar, some Israeli politicians have called for launching a widespread military operation in the West Bank. For now, the army says it's beefing up its troop presence across the occupied territory. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has also announced plans to build 1,000 new settler homes in Eli, near where the attack took place on Tuesday. The move could intensify violence on both sides. At least 174 Palestinians and 25 Israelis have been killed so far this year. The amount of oxygen on the missing submersible with five people on board is becoming a vital issue. Some experts say as more advanced equipment is rushed to the North Atlantic Ocean in a complex international search operation, now at its most critical juncture, banging noises also were detected from underneath and in the massive search area have provided hope for survivors. But it's like finding a needle in the haystack. And time is off the essence inside the 21-foot submersible with rudimentary controls and no room for its passengers to stretch out. The crew would have had limited rations of food and water, officials have further revealed. However, it remains unclear whether the noises are from the missing submissible. As Rick Merkar, the Association of Cave Divers, have asserted that various environmental factors in the ocean are likely complicating efforts to identify the noises, further implying that the currents in the water can deflect the sound of that it appears like it is coming from miles away from where the actual source is. He linked the effort to locate the noise to trying to pinpoint a specific snare drum in a stadium full of cheering fans and other instruments. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission accused Amazon of enrolling millions of consumers into its paid subscription Amazon Prime service without their consent and making it hard for them to cancel. A top U.S. regulator accused Amazon of duping millions of customers into unknowingly signing up for its Prime paid service. That's according to a lawsuit filed by the Federal Trade Commission on Wednesday. In the filing, the FTC said the online retail behemoth used, quote, manipulative, coercive, or deceptive user interface designs known as dark patterns to trick consumers into enrolling in automatically renewing Prime subscriptions and, quote, sabotaged their attempts to cancel. The company did not immediately respond to a request for comment. According to the complaint, consumers who attempted to cancel their Prime subscriptions were faced with multiple hurdles. In a statement, FTC Chair Lena Khan said, quote, Amazon tricked and trapped people into recurring subscriptions without their consent, not only frustrating users but also costing them significant money. Prime members in the U.S. generally pay $139 per year and drive much of Amazon's sales volume. Prime, which offers free shipping and access to movies, TV, and other benefits, has more than 200 million members worldwide. The FTC has been investigating Amazon's sign-up and cancellation practices for its Prime service since March of 2021. The agency had requested that CEO Andy Jassy and founder Jeff Bezos testify at investigative hearings and in September of last year rejected a bid by Amazon to quash that demand, which the e-commerce giant called overly burdensome. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Welcome back. An Air National Guardsman accused of leaking U.S. military secrets pleaded not guilty to six federal counts of willful retention and transmission of classified information relating to national defense. The Air National Guardsman accused of leaking U.S. military secrets pleaded not guilty on Wednesday to six federal counts of willful retention and transmission of classified information relating to national defense, according to a court filing. Jack Douglas Teixeira appeared in a federal court in Massachusetts for an arraignment after his arrest in April over the disclosure of U.S. documents related to the Ukraine war and numerous other sensitive issues. In a statement released after the arraignment, Teixeira's family said they, quote, are hopeful Jack will be getting the fair and just treatment he deserves. 
prosecutors say Teixeira leaked classified documents to a group of gamers on the messaging app Discord. The leak is considered the most serious U.S. national security breach since more than 700,000 documents, videos, and diplomatic cables appeared on the WikiLeaks website in 2010. President Joe Biden has ordered an investigation into why the alleged leaker had access to the sensitive information. Yes, I've instructed the department to make sure that they get to the root of why he had access in the first place. Teixeira has been held in federal prison in Plymouth County, south of Boston, while awaiting trial. No trial date has been set. Two of the world's most high-profile technology billionaires, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, have agreed to fight each other in a cage match. Musk posted a message on his social media platform Twitter that he was up for a cage fight with Zuckerberg and Zuckerberg, the boss of Facebook and Instagram, parent company Meta, then posted a screenshot of uh, Musk's tweet with the caption, send me location. A Meta spokesperson reported to the media that the story speaks for itself. Musk then replied to Zuckerberg's response with Vegas Octagon. The Octagon is the competition mat and fenced in area used for Ultimate Fighting Championship or UFC bouts. Musk, who turns 52 later this month, tweeted that he almost never works out. Meanwhile, 39-year-old Zuckerberg has already been training in mixed martial arts and has recently won jiu-jitsu tournaments. Earlier this month, Meta showed staff plans for a text-based social network designed to compete with Twitter. The Meta spokesperson confirmed that the platform was in development. The text-based network which has a working title of P92 could turn out to be a greater rival to Elon Musk's Twitter than either Blue Sky or Mastodon. Lawmakers in South Korea revised a bill that will mean stalkers can be subjected to criminal punishment whether the victim has given their consent. This amid growing calls from the public to mend loopholes in the law. Moving forward, stalkers in South Korea can be subject to criminal punishment even without consent from the victims. During a plenary session on Wednesday, the National Assembly expanded the standards to criminalize the act of stalking by unanimously passing some key revisions to the Stalking Punishment Act. As all 246 of the 246 lawmakers present have voted in support, I declare that the partial revision to the Act on the Punishment of Stalking Crimes has been passed. A campaign pledge of President Yoon song yeol the revision had been eagerly sought after the existing law's flaws were exposed in the Shindang Station murder case in Seoul last year, where a 28-year-old woman was stabbed to death by her stalker of three years, a 31-year-old man, while he was on trial without detention for stalking. Crime analysts said at the time that stalkers were taking advantage of the consent loophole by threatening victims to withdraw their complaints. Wednesday's revisions will also allow courts, if they judge it necessary to protect victims during hearings, to require stalkers to wear electronic anklets even before conviction. Perpetrators who remove or damage the devices will face imprisonment of up to three years or a fine of up to 30 million Korean won, which is around 23,000 US dollars. I believe the revised bill contains at least a general overview of most of the things that can be thought of to protect victims of stalking crimes. Also classifies acts of recklessly sending texts, photos, or video files through electronic devices as stalking. Providing the personal information or location of victims to third parties, or stealing such information to impersonate them online, will be criminalized as well. On the final day of his visit, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol declared his Paris initiative setting out the basis principles that the world should follow to ensure digital development is for and not against humans' well-being. President Yoon suk yeol has proposed a new global body and a universal set of norms for digital development to ensure that the freedom and welfare of people around the world are not harmed by technology. The South Korean leader announced his Paris initiative on Wednesday, speaking at the Sorbonne University in the French capital. 
given the borderless, immediate and connected nature of digital technologies. Yun said a universal digital order is needed on a global scale. He first and foremost established that digital advancement should serve to expand human freedom, dignity and welfare. Second, Yun noted that a clear definition of rights to digital use and assets needs to be clarified to promote active transactions and the development of data. In this regard, digital access should be open for all, with digital literacy education crucial for such efforts. Yun called for global collaboration to bridge digital literacy gaps. Deeming data and digital information public goods, the president emphasised that fair access and equal opportunity for all should be guaranteed. He further raised the need for a fair evaluation and reward system to incentivise investments and development efforts. In order to prevent social harm, Yoon also said information on social risks must be shared and publicised promptly with a regulatory system in place. Any violation would be deemed illegal and sanctioned. Most importantly, the South Korean leader said the international community must join hands in such regulatory efforts. He proposed creating a global body to standardise and initiate such basic norms within the context of the digital economy and society. To establish the institution, he suggested United Nations organisations could lead the conversation. Noting that the president was inspired by various discussions, including at the G20, Davos, and the New York Digital Vision Forum last September, his economic secretary said a multilateral set of norms will continue to be developed through intellectual discourse. It is especially meaningful that the initiative was proposed in Paris, the birthplace of the Enlightenment and the Civil Revolution. Time magazine is out with its 100 most influential companies list for 2023 and Kia America has been listed in the innovators category for its unexpected race to the top of EV sales in the United States. Every year since 2021, Time magazine releases its annual list of 100 most influential companies split in five categories, leaders, disruptors, innovators, titans and pioneers. And for the 2023 list, three South Korean companies have made it onto the top 100. Samsung and SK Group were listed under the Titans category as smartphone trendsetters and battery makers. And Kia America made it to the top of the list in the innovators category for its unexpected race to the top of the U.S. electric vehicle sales. Kia vehicles have a new reputation. Kia America President and CEO Yoon Sung gyu said during an interview with Time magazine that people are surprised when they get into a Kia vehicle because it's not the Kia they remember. In 2022, 60% of its customers were new to the brand. Tesla still holds pole position in U.S. electric vehicle sales, but Kia America shed its reputation for inexpensive cars and hit a new annual sales record in 2022 with its launch of the EV6 crossover, which took the brand into second place in EV sales for most of the year in the U.S. Kia America has been harmed by last year's Inflation Reduction Act, which requires EVs to be assembled in North America in order to qualify for tax credits. But CEO Yoon says the company is gradually overcoming the challenge thanks to the tax credits offered for leasing. To stay in the race for U.S. electric vehicle dominance, Kia is planning to begin production of their newest EV, the EV9, in West Point, Georgia, next year. Fifteen EV models are planned for Kia's global lineup by 2027. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A gas explosion at a barbecue restaurant in China's northwestern Ningxia region killed 31. The blast in Yinchuan, capital of Ningxia, was caused by a leaking liquefied petroleum gas tank at the restaurant. Spanish coast guards intercepted a dinghy carrying 63 migrants 60 miles southeast of the Spanish island of Gran Canaria in the Atlantic Ocean. Arrivals in the Canary Island has increased due to favorable weather at sea leading more people to make the perilous journey from North Africa. The Vatican confirmed Pope Francis met Brazilian President Luiz Inacio Lula da Silva and discussed a range of common concerns including peace, poverty, inequality and the environment. 
President Vladimir Putin said in remarks that Moscow had seen a lull in Ukraine's counter-offensive and that Kyiv had suffered heavy losses in attacks in the south. His comments came as Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said his army's progress was slower than desired but that Kyiv would not be pressured into rushing it. Heavy clashes and artillery fire broke out in Sudan's capital shortly after a 72-hour truce between the warring parties. Fighting between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces first erupted in mid-April and has interrupted the lives of local residents in the country's greater capital area. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we end off in the Chinese mainland where dragon boats, races, and other folk cultural activities are being held across China recently to mark the traditional dragon boat festival. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>